Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Lance Olson's novel, Head in Flames. This was first published in 2009 by uh, Chiasmus Press, but this version here was published in 2017 by Widow and Orphan House. Lance Olson is a really prolific American author whose works are often very experimental, both in subject and form, and thus he's pretty underread. I came to him simply by Googling uh, experimental authors, um, because I often get bored of books in which the author doesn't seem to really care about the form. That is, they're not using the form for specific purposes. They're just writing like a very straightforward novel. Um, but Lance Olson is notorious for really embedding the philosophy of his novels in the form, in the form of his craft. And this book, Head in Flames, is no exception to his experimental tendencies. And I actually, I actually started with this book particularly because this past summer I got really into um, Vincent van Gogh. I went to the that Van Gogh experience, which if you live in the States and live near a big city, you probably have seen advertisements for. Um, it's kind of making its way through most major cities in the US. Um, but I've also been reading uh, quite a bit of Van Gogh's letters, um, and I found them just really, really interesting. And what I really find so interesting about Van Gogh's life is the, kind of obvious, but the contrast between how massively popular he is today, right? There's this Vincent Van Gogh experience that I went to and there were just you know hundreds of people there experiencing Vincent van Gogh's work. But in his life, of course, he was really destitute, right? He famously never sold many paintings. And it's a sort of well-trodden point, but it really does seem that we often can't fully wrap our heads around artists who are producing in our own day. Often it takes a generation or two for their art to really be understood and embraced by the masses. And Van Gogh really is just the perfect example of this. But so this book, Head in Flames, the most interesting part right up front is the structure. This book is told in three distinct voices all at the exact same time. And each voice is marked visually by a different font. But each of these voices are really differentiated by these incredibly different political and ideological and religious and artistic views. Each of these voices read so distinctly. But importantly, none of these voices on the physical page, nor in the cumulative artistic whole, none of these voices are privileged over any of the others. The first voice is Vincent van Gogh's own voice on a July day in 1890, the day that he kills himself. And his voice is dreamy and abstract as he contemplates both art and the place of art in this world, as well as his own place in this world, and of course, his own suicide. He meditates on all of these big ideas, which if you've read any of his letters, um, you know that these big artistic ideas kind of plagued him throughout his life as he wrote all of these letters, especially to his brother. Um, trying to figure out the answer to these questions. But mixed into these dreamy meditations in this book is Van Gogh struggling with his own mortality as he fiddles with a pistol that's in his pocket. And, you know, we all know how it ends. The second voice is Theo Van Gogh, who is Vincent Van Gogh's brother's great-grandson, who on a November morning in 2004, as he's riding his bike to work in the morning, is assassinated by an Islamic terrorist named Mohamed Bouyeri. And Theo van Gogh is assassinated because he created, alongside the Somali-born uh, Dutch-American politician, activist, artist, etc., Ayan Hirsi Ali. Together, they created this short film called Submission, which heavily critiqued um, fundamentalist Islamic beliefs and their specifically their views on the regressive views on gender and the treatment of women specifically. It was a provocative and controversial film, clearly. And the third and final voice is that of Mohamed Bouyeri, who assassinates and beheads Theo van Gogh on that November morning in 2004. And this voice really delves deeply into the fundamentalist and reactionary and extremist ideologies that led him to, so, to become so enraged about a film that he sought out Theo van Gogh and murdered him publicly. These three voices are monumentally different, but again, none of these voices dominate this narrative. They all work together. Mohamed Bouyeri's blatant and violent uh, misogyny and homophobia is voiced right next to Vincent van Gogh's meditations on the power of art. These three voices work together and they produce a chorus of social consciousness. 
And let me actually just read the opening of this book so you can get a sense of how these three voices work together. And note, the F slur is used uh, quite a bit in these opening pages, and I'm not going to read that aloud. I don't believe in like censoring artists by any means, but you know, there's a giant difference between censoring an artist and some random dude on YouTube reading it out loud. But anyways, the first voice is uh, Vincent Van Gogh, the second is Theo Van Gogh's, and the third is Mohamed Bouyeri. The text reads, Look, I am standing inside the color yellow. Look, something wells up at the corner of Theo Van Gogh's vision as he bikes to work one morning, 114 years later. Look, the short, fat, filthy pig pedaling among the herd of short, fat, filthy pigs in his F-blue t-shirt, F-stripped suspenders, F-gray jacket, F-tattered jeans. The vast field of ripe wheat in July. A dreary Tuesday in November. You stepping leisurely from the doorway into Allah's will. Afternoon sun shining in my chest, the high yellow notes swarming, how the dusty heat sparkles the atmosphere with flecks of light. Vincent Van Gogh's brother's great-grandson, peddling. He's where he's supposed to be, you where you're supposed to be, and this is how you bring two trajectories together. How these elements unspool into a ravishing Sunday. Peddling, Theo absentmindedly imagines himself a pudgy 47-year-old pufferfish with short blonde curls darting on a black bike among a school of them on Leonis Street. How nothing is ex unexpected any longer. Not something you hear, something you inhabit. Its own acoustic body, skin. The cool fog gauzing Ooster Park ahead. Sky, a dull vaporous aluminum. Air noisy with diesel fumes waiting in the doorway until he reaches the end of the block, and then you will simply walk into the future. Over Sewi, 1890. Amsterdam, 2004. Someday, they will write about these things. So as you can see, each voice is obviously preoccupied with very different ideas and sensations and emotions, but as I hope you can see from this opening, they all intersect and they all intertwine. At first, it seems like it's difficult to follow, but then you start to really see how each of these voices is so distinct and how each voice makes up only one section of the chorus. And these three voices, these three incredibly different men, just all happen to be connected across time and place, whether they want to be or not. And Olsen plays with this idea a lot. Many of the snippets from uh, in the voice of Vincent Van Gogh seem to be uh, either based on or are direct quotes from Vincent Van Gogh's own letters. He was writing to his brother Theo, but of course, in this book, it's Theo's uh, great-grandson who, who is named Theo. So it, it's almost as if Vincent Van Gogh from the past in 1890 is kind of writing letters to his brother's great-grandson 114 years later. And Mohamed Bouyeri often uses the second person, often referring to himself as you, which has the effect that he's both speaking to us and that he is being spoken to, perhaps by a domineering and pervasive ideology. So these voices all work together, and they often work together by working against each other, right? They often interrupt each other and contradict each other, and they, they definitely disagree with each other. But the cumulative effect is this single narrative, a single meditation on faith, art, and mortality. And all of these narrators, these three characters, have their, you know, their head in flames with all of the different positive and negative connotations of flames and fire being very apparent, right? For Vincent, the flames are sunflowers, which are, of course, some of his most famous paintings, all of which have these bright and dreamy and jubilant color schemes, with yellow obviously being dominant. But of course, this whole time, he's contemplating things like the absence of God and, well, his own suicide. Further, his self-mutilation of his ear and eventually of his own life is intertwined with his legacy of these paintings of sunflowers. The fire is both creation and destruction. Theo Van Gogh's head is in flames because of his anger and outrage, whether justified or not, I think it's justified, at extremist Islamic ideologies. Note the extremist there. There's a brutal description of uh, female genital mutilation that haunts uh, both him and us. And this bodily mutilation is a constant theme across these three voices. And of course, Mohammed Bouyeri's head is in flames because of his perverse ideology, which drives his violent misogyny and homophobia and his self-hatred. The voice of his father is really important to him. 
and he plays a key role in this novel because he's often aggressively attacking and indoctrinating the you of Mohamed Bouyeri. Mohamed Bouyeri can't get the voice of his father out of his own head. And I really think that Olsen's writing style is just immaculately beautiful because again, these three voices don't act against each other. They're not in competition, even though they constantly disagree ideologically and artistically, but they work together to create a single multivalent and polyphonic exploration of these ideas. And Olsen uses a minimalist prose to explore how the difference between these characters is both vast and, well, not very much, right? For as different as they are, these three characters can't seem to escape each other. You can't mention Mohamed Bouyeri without mention, mentioning his assassination of Theo Van Gogh. And you can't mention Theo Van Gogh without noting that he is the great grandson of Vincent Van Gogh's brother. And I also just love Olsen's tendency to use nouns as verbs. It's something that I've always had a really big soft spot for. Um, right in, in the opening lines to this book, Vincent says, afternoon sun shining in my chest, which is just beautiful, but it reminds me so much of um, one of my favorite lines from Shakespeare, from uh, Shakespeare's The Tempest. When Ariel creates The Tempest in the opening, opening act, he then goes back to Prospero and he tells Prospero, I flamed amazement. And I just love that line. And it, Olsen is constantly making all of these nouns into verbs and it's, it's, just, it's just beautiful. Um, but this book is brilliant in my opinion in both of its exploration of its theme and in the exploration of its structure. The structure doesn't come across as a gimmick as it often does in experimental fiction. Here the form, the structure, is the point. It's not just a gimmick. Olsen wields it just so effectively that you really just have to read the book. A review can't do it justice because, well, I only have one voice and this book has three. But before I end, I do want to note that while I was doing research for this video, I came across uh, George Salas's uh, text interview with Lance Olsen, in which they talk about this book a little bit, um, and they talk quite a bit about the form and the philosophy of the form uh, in this book, but they also talk about um, Olsen's other books as well. And Salas is just a really great interviewer and asks very uh, astute questions. Um, and Olsen gives very generous and very informative answers. Um, it's on the Kaleidoscope website. I highly recommend checking it out. And George Salas also has his own review of, of this book, which is, you know, if you're looking for something much more coherent and, well, smarter than this review, go read his review on the Kaleidoscope. I'll leave links down below. But I'm really excited to read more of Lance Olsen's work. I have... Um, My Red Heaven here, which I think came out last year. And I'm excited to get to that. And I've also already pre-ordered. Lance Olsen has another book coming out in November and I've already pre-ordered it. So I'm looking forward to getting that as well. So expect more Lance Olsen on this channel. But for now, let me know uh, if you read any, uh, any of his books um, and let me know what you think of them. Um, I'm really excited to talk more about him. And I'm really excited to read more about him. So for now, thanks for watching.